Okay, so this is another video from the same day. I was going to be doing a, uh, so this is something funny. I was going to be starting a regular habit of recording, uh, little YouTube videos like this on Sunday evenings when I'm all, uh, nice and dolled up like this after various events, because Sunday's usually the day when I'm presenting the nicest, but uh, something amazing happened. I had more time than I expected this afternoon, and I shot the video this afternoon, so I'm able to make a second one on the same day, because why wouldn't I? So, the first video was an absolute mess. There were like three different subtopics in it. The first thing I could was... <sighs> Was it really three? Well, the main subtopics that I recall were basically me complaining about how little I make sense, and then me uh, trying to explain why I'm trying to throw my baggage onto other people, and then the last bit that I recall was uh, actually a long, perhaps slightly uncomfortable for you anecdote about why I got into personality typing. Um, although, if you actually do watch that, that might explain why I made such an ass of myself in the Facebook group when we were talking about deductive and inductive reasoning. Sorry, it's just that that particular thing is actually what got me into personality typing in the first place. But, um, but... At the very end, at the very end, I planted the seeds for something a little bit more plain than this. Me telling you the story of how I got my name. Uh, that name being Mary. Uh, I'm named after St. Mary, Jesus' mom. And so I guess the first thing to talk about uh, in this video is my background as a Catholic. I am no longer Catholic. Um, it's very, very difficult to be a uh, transgender in the Catholic Church. Technically possible, but extremely difficult. And extra difficult for gay people in the Catholic Church. And then throw in my, you know, sort of theological disagreements, and then killed it. Made it basically impossible for me to stay Catholic, but... Uh, but when I was, when I was Catholic for almost 24 years, it was probably the single most important thing in my life. So, here's my history with Catholicism. Um... I was I'm a I was a cradle Catholic. I was born, raised Catholic. Uh, didn't go to a Catholic school. Went to public school, but um, my preschool was closely affiliated with my church, so that's something. Uh, my parents were uh, pretty religious, um, and I took it up. It wasn't one of the cases where like. The parents are more religious and the kids sort of already an atheist sort of pushing against it no I was I was into this stuff like like at the age of like six or seven when we had a conversation where I found out that Santa didn't exist like Santa Claus uh, the reason I got to that point was because I'd been like okay and this is me when I was still a little kid I was like okay so um you so Santa Claus is St. Nicholas, right? And I heard that we don't canonize saints until after they're dead. Right? So, okay, so... How can Santa be a saint if he's still alive? And I asked my mom this, and my dad, and I assumed... Honestly, when I asked the question that the Pope had just made an exception for an, ex an exception for Santa because he was just that good of a person, but uh, that was that was not the answer I got. Nope, not the answer I got at all. 
but yeah, um, a lot of kids will figure out Santa doesn't exist, uh, either when, maybe when they're directly told, maybe when they actually see Santa getting in and out of a costume, maybe when they see their parents putting gifts under the tree. I figured it out because it was theologically incompatible with Catholicism. That is how I figured out Santa did not exist. Yeah. Um, but I don't think I got extremely serious about my Catholicism until I was like in seventh grade. When I read a book by a guy named Peter Kreeft. It's spelled K-R-E-E-F-T, so it looks like Kreeft, but I think it's pronounced Kreeft. Um, and this Peter Kreeft guy is Catholic. He is or was a philosophy professor at Boston College. And the book in question was called The Journey, A Modern Road Map for Spiritual Pilgrims, some kind of really pretentious name like that. And... Recently, just out of curiosity, almost to get ready for this conversation, I like looked up a PDF of it to the to whatever extent I could find a free PDF of it. Like, hey, oh look, first thirty pages, and I was like, oh wow, so that's where I got that idea from. That's amazing. But if I were to really go into it, really give the summary of the journey, so. Uh, it starts off with the author, Peter Kreeft, who in, you know, real life was already a very diehard Catholic at that point, so it doesn't work. It's him basically in a subterranean cave uh, with Socrates trying to walk out of the cave, talking to all these various philosophers at Forks in the Road. Uh, whenever he's trying to decide a philosophical question, like... He's trying to figure out uh, whether or not there's such a thing as objective morality. And then he and Socrates along their little road will walk into, Hey, Thrasymachus, what are you doing here? And it's just uh, a, like ten chapters, each of which is some kind of question, at which point, you know, Peter Kreeft's author insert and, so and Socrates run into the person and have a conversation. They're like, your philosophy's wrong, we're gonna go this way. And just keep doing that. And, of course, Peter Kreeft, being super Catholic, wrote the book almost as a polemic in favor of Christianity. It doesn't touch on Catholicism specifically. You pick that up in his other books. But he was Catholic, and if nothing else, the journey is very much a Christian polemic. Um, now, for me to talk about that particular book is is tricky. I don't know whether or not to recommend it to people because I think if I ever well here's the thing when I re-encountered it or re-read through parts of it years later after having a bit more outside familiarity with the philosophers like from class and stuff there were a lot of straw man arguments in there like a lot so I would not, you know, throw that book at any serious thinker in one of the philo philosophical schools that he critiques. But it was a foundational book, and at least something, some things from it stuck with me through the years. One of the most compelling... There's a kind of... tier list to it all. Because the first... Because here's the thing. Although the book is ultimately a religious one, God doesn't come into the picture until chapter 7. The book almost treats religion as an extension of philosophy. Okay, like you ask this question about the nature of objective truth, and then you ask this question about uh, the nature of meaning, and then you ask this question about whether or not there is more to the universe than mere matter, then you ask this question about whether or not there is such a thing as objective right or, right or wrong, and only then 
are you even in a position to consider the possibility of God? Which I still think is actually pretty correct. Because, well, think about it. If you are a moral relativist, you basically can't believe in God because, well, if God is defined as all good, but good isn't a permanent, permanent objective thing, then obviously an intrinsically good being, like, objectively good, not just good in my opinion or your opinion, wouldn't be able to exist. So, like, a moral relativist can't be a Christian, just according to that basic framework. And, and you could argue the point, but honestly, I think the little divisions and stuff like that sort of hold up. It made me realize, okay, it, it, it didn't convert me to Catholicism. I was already a Catholic, but being sort of walked there step by step, I was like, wow, I hadn't realized all these sort of philosophical assumptions that you needed to make in order for Catholicism to work. Quite a few. Um, and it sort of gave me, you know, this impression that a lot of the different philosophies out there were almost like steps in a pyramid or something, like they built off one another, like once you believe that asking philosophical questions is worthwhile, then and only then are you really able to look at the question of whether or not there is such a thing as objective truth at all. And it is only once you look at that question and say, yeah, some things are true regardless of whether or not I already know them, it is only once you've gotten that far that you're able to wonder, okay, so is there truth, like, about the meaning of life beyond just the truth of, am I holding up a fing one finger or two? And it is only once that question's involved that you can look at nihilism. And it's only once that question's involved that you can go to the next one. And it showed that all of these sort of philosophical convictions, yes, there is tr uh, truth. Yes, it is worth pursuing. Yes, life has a meaning. No, it is not a material meaning. All of those little ideas were necessarily connected. You wouldn't be able to change an idea at the bottom of the chain without affecting all the ideas up at the top. You wouldn't be able to go, okay, yeah, life is meaningless, but I still believe in an objective right and, right, right and wrong, and I still believe in God, and I still believe in this. No, you, you wouldn't be able to. You can't. Like, I, I'm, I'm sure someone out there is going to say that they do, but, like... But the thing is, um... Yeah, I mean, like, wouldn't the existence of God be a sort of anchor of meaning or a meaningful thing? Nihilism, you can't be a nihilist... Christian, or a Christian nihilist, does just doesn't work, and well, that's the thing about the journey. It gave me this paradigm that I'm describing to you now, and looking back on it, I'm trying to figure out how much of the paradigm I agree with, and how much truth there is in it, and how much falseness there there is in it, and the answer is complicated and it would take some time to unravel. Basically, if you are a nihilist in the sense in which Peter Kreeft uses the term nihilist, then obviously you can't be a Christian. And if you're a moral relativist in the sense in which Peter Kreeft uses the term moral relativist, you cannot be a Christian. Just little bits and pieces like that. And certainly in the is there such a thing as objective truth one? That was the second question addressed in the book. The very first being, hey, should we care about this at all and start asking? That was that was an amusing chapter, and to me it seemed like the most obvious answer in the world. Oh, yes, 
That's not that's not hard. Uh, and of course, going through the rest of the book, like I said, a lot of the arguments were straw man arguments. But one of the things I loved about them, even if I don't know how well the arguments held up on further reflection, is the fact that in each one, the demonstration was very much a sort of top-down logic thing that didn't assume any elaborate premises beyond what everyone there already understood. Like, I mean, Peter Kreeft is an admirer of the Socratic dialogues, if nothing else, and everything is sort of written so that the character basically just asks people rhetorical questions so that they basically make the argument on their own that he wants them to make. That's sort of what the character of Socrates does in Plato's dialogues and what he does here. Not that I'm saying that Socrates was only a, ca a character of Plato's. I believe there was an actual person named Socrates, but... Uh, but that's neither here nor there. I think... I think... Well, the fact that I encountered... That I first encountered the entire field of philosophy in that book I don't know it gave me a very black and white paradigm of looking at the whole thing one that it took a long time to outgrow but even seeing that it was black and white and that there were things that needed to be corrected especially on question number two the, the question about objective truth a lot to go over there um, but I'll say this, it gave a very, very oversimplified version of the truth, but still a version of the truth. And I loved it. It was like crack to me. Uh, the arguments were crack. Uh, the spirituality in it was crack. I mean, like... And it was an addicting drug. It was just, I needed more of it. It was so good. And th one of the best things about Peter Kreeft, even if he's not as logical as he seems to be on first glance, he's so... And, and, and sometimes his theology sucks. His politics are incredibly reactionary. Oh my god. Uh, I'm such a problematic faith, but... But he could be so winsome sometimes. Like, when he actually did get near the end of the book, and he actually did, like, start talking about Christianity specifically, and Jesus specifically, you got to under You got to see, okay, this guy doesn't just think Christianity as a set of statements. This is something he feels as well. This is something that's part of his mind and part of his heart. And I've met him. I've met Peter Craved in person twice, and yeah. This is as much in his heart as it is in his mind. He's incredibly flawed. Some of the times his arguments don't work. Sometimes he's very reactionary. He's unbelievably misogynistic. But... But the good parts about Peter Kraft weren't just good, they were life-changing. So I read a lot more of his stuff. The St. Teresa's Church Library had a lot of material by him. So I read a lot um, about the virtues, about other, about aspects of Catholicism specifically, as opposed to just Christianity in general, about uh, various moral decision-making issues, books about this, books about that, books about the nature of suffering. And that was a question I've come back to a lot later down the line, and which actually, actually later, someday, I'm going to need to talk about this. This is uh, The Doors of the Sea by David Bentley Hart. It's the best book on theodicy ever written. Um, 
I only read this within the last year. Uh, oh, that's a side topic. It's going to take me so long to actually get enough of the context into these videos that I can actually talk about Doors of the Sea, but I really want to talk about Doors of the Sea. It's such a... Oh my god, it's so beautiful. Um, okay, but I'm going to try to stick to Peter Crave right now. I guess the next... Oh my... Okay, see, the next book of Peter Crave I'm going to mention... I can't believe I'm... It's titled... I kid you not... How to Win the Culture War. Like I said, he was very conservative. Is very conservative. I think he's technically still alive at like 80-something. So you can imagine what kind of social politics at least you're going to find in a book called How to Win the Culture War. And, well... You can imagine what that would mean for someone like me. It is a book that's really difficult to look at in retrospect. You can fill in the blanks yourself, but here's the funny thing. Although he rants at about a lot of the typical conservative talking points and shares them, and unfortunately I bought into a lot of them as a kid. I read this when I was like a teenager and I didn't know I was trans yet and I didn't... <sighs> But, but the part of it that I'm coming to here, the part that mattered was chapter seven about, okay, this is the nature of the war. This is the battle that we're fighting over, you know, the family and tradition and all this stuff. And this is why that is so important. Blah, 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 blah. This is why the modern world is too liberal. Blah, 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 blah. This is how we fix it. And you'd think it would be something disgusting, like, we just need to control the Supreme Court or some shit like that, but I think this is why the book still matters to me and is not horrifying. Because his answer was, we need to be saints. Now, of course, Catholic kid reading this is going to think of, you know, the people who show up in artwork and all that, and just, like, basically religiously flavored superheroes. That's what I understood sainthood to be. But to Peter Crave, like, no, like, seriously. People who love, like Jesus, are almost like many Jesuses. And they affect the world like miniature Jesuses. Sanctity, holiness, the kind you get by being a good, loving, Christ-like person, that's powerful. That's more powerful than anything political could be. That is how Christianity survived in the early days with, from like a group of only just 12 Jewish guys with, who are like peasants and fishermen and stuff. That is how Mother Teresa did what she did. That's how um, Joan of Arc did what she did. That's how St. Francis did what he did. That's even, and step outside the Catholic Church. Freaking, that's, <sighs> but yeah, I, People like that really do change the world. And to Peter Kreef, the answer of, okay, how do we pull society back from degeneracy and back towards God? Well, we don't do it by making better books or movies or laws or anything. We do that by being like this. And if we are like that, the world will change. And here is the craziest thing about this. He was 
recommending it not as in like, you know, we should pray that God sends more people like that. And it was like, no, no, we shouldn't like pray that God will make more people like that. We should become like that. Like you and I, we can be saints. We can. We really, really can. Because they were people like us who, you know, were called to holiness and chose to live a holier life and, you know, serve and all that stuff. And that call is offered to literally everyone. It is being offered to me. It is being offered to you. The only reason we are not already saints is because we don't want to be. But why wouldn't we want to be? Isn't that so cool? Because it takes everything from you. Because the cost is huge. The cost could mean giving up, giving away your family fortune, like with St. Francis. It could mean being burned alive, like with St. Lawrence. It could be something much smaller. It could just be, you know, the exhaustion that comes from uh, caring so much about a world you can't fix in one day. But, like, signing on for a holy life, life with that kind of commitment, it takes a lot out of you. You're handing God a blank check and letting him write in whatever he will. That's why it's so scary to pursue that kind of life, to choose that kind of life. But that's what we need to do. Because we can. And knowing that we can, how could we ever be satisfied with being anything less? So, I read this, I, I wasn't even in high school yet, and I was like, okay, so this is what I need to do with my life. How do I do that? So Catholicism, I haven't even gotten into the full story of Catholicism with me, but I've gotten somewhere, I've told you about the impact of this one author named Peter Kraft. And I began to encounter two sort of competing paradigms or competing sets of values that this whole thing, and Peter Kraft never actually said this, this is just the assumption that I went in with. This is just what I took away from it. This is just what I let myself believe for so long. That faith was basically a big intellectual exercise. It was making a series of apologetic arguments in favor of the theological proposition that God exists, or Jesus is his son, or whatever. And faith is about believing that set of statements, and the statements that logically accompany them. That is half of what I thought it was. And the other half of what I thought it was, was this some kind of extraordinary, powerful call, well, to give and to grow. So... The story of how I got my name is the story of how half of my faith died. And in the process, the other half was able to continue living. I don't know what part two is going to be, but I think that's a good start. <laughs>